Welcome to Novel Ideas, Chats with Local Authors. I'm Carolyn Luck, and I'm here with my co-host, Josh Brogadier. Great to be with you as always, Carol. And tonight we have two very special guests. Josh, would and you like to I would love to introduce these two gentlemen here. Mark Duffield is to my right. Paul Serafini is to my left. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. You both have long introductions, but we'll start out, first of all, because it all is based around this book that's in my hands here, <laughs> The Last Shepherd, Tales of the Tenth Ornament. Mm -hmm. A wee yarn of wonder at Christmas time. Mark, you wrote this. Paul, you want to make this into a movie. That's right. Let's start with you for a moment, Mark. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to write this book. Well, I think uh, it goes back right after college, I think. And uh, I became a commercial fisherman on Nantucket Island and did that for about 15 years. And during those intervening years, I would take a dart, throw it at a map, and go there. And I'd always come back broke, like I am today. <laughs> and, uh, but I could always get back on the boat and go back out again. So I did that for a number of years. Uh, my dad passed away. I scattered his ashes at sea in Nantucket and went down to the Gulf of Mexico to fish down there. Got caught in a perfect storm. Almost lost my life. And I said, you know, my fishing days are over. So I came to Boston to uh, seek my fame and fortune, none of which I found. But I did find, or they found me, I guess, public television at WGBH, and I was there for nearly 15 years as well. And then went over, without a resume, they hired me. <laughs> Unbelievable, huh? And then over to New England Conservatory, where I did their corporate uh, fundraising for five years. And then I became co-owner of a little store on Beacon Hill called Blackstones, where I wrote this book. Many people are familiar with Blackstones. Yes. I'm sure a lot of our viewers will be. Yes. You could probably make a story on Mark's life based on what he just <laughs> yes. told us, Paul, but there's something a little different. Get it? Tell us a little bit about why this is an important project. Uh, well, just to, to dovetail to that just for a second, we are going to make a story on... on did I tell you that yet? No, <laughs> no. <Yes. laughs> no, actually, um, we're hoping that, you know, we, we, when, if we can get Last Shepherd turned into a feature film at the same time, we're going to try to do a little bit of a documentary on Mark's life. Who's, he's, Mark's just living the, lived this extraordinary life to end up to this point right here, and then he created this wonderful, timeless story um, called The Last Shepherd. And, um, it's something that Mark and I have known each other for many years. I did used to work at WGBH myself um, uh, years ago, and um, and uh, you know we've always kind of connected, um, you know, on a variety of levels. I think we're but, friends instantly. Yes, exactly. And um, I'm uh, I've been a director and producer for 25 years, um, and a lot of it is in, been in family entertainment and. Um, uh, I just uh, directed uh, my first feature film. I've been directed television for 25 years. My first feature film um, is called Annabelle Hooper and the Ghosts mm -hmm. of Nantucket. Um, but for uh, my pro my company is interested in, in developing a lot of projects, and one of the things that I've always wanted to do was a Christmas story or a Christmas movie. But and I won't mention any networks' names here. Fair enough. <laughs> but um, just, I'm not interested in doing a, you know, a cookie-cutter Christmas uh, tale. I do, those are fun, I get it. Everybody likes to watch those, I do too. Mm -hmm. But I, I really would like to make a film that is something that resonates for years to come and becomes a classic one that you do want to watch over and over once a year, because that's what I used to do when I, oops, sorry, hitting the mic there. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's what I used to do when I was growing up, and uh, you know, <coughs> we watch It's a Wonderful Life every year. We, you know, watch uh, A Christmas Story every year. We watch Charlie Brown every year, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, things that have that, and, and Mark's book, when I read it, um, he reached out to me after my movie was released and said, hey, I wrote this Christmas book by complete coincidence. Oh, I'm looking for a Christmas story. <laughs> so I read it and I loved it, and uh, you know, we want to try to make a movie out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can we back up a little bit, Paul? Let's sure. talk a few minutes about Annabelle Hooper. Yes. Um, I absolutely loved this because I am so tired of dystopia and all of this fantasy kinds of things. Uh -huh. And when I watched this movie, I just 
I was just there and it was so gorgeous. Could you just tell us a little bit about Annabelle Hooper and how she came to be? Sure. I grew up um, going to Nantucket Island. Like Mark worked on Nantucket Island for so many years. I didn't actually work there, but I vacationed <laughs> there <laughs> since 1968. Now I'm really dating myself when I was extremely young. You weren't hanging out at the bars like No, I was, I was not hanging out at the bars. Right? That, came, that came later, but, but you know, back when I was a kid, in the 70s and 80s, I would go, literally go to the movies every single night. My parents would go out to dinner at a different restaurant. I'd join them afterwards for dessert, but I would always go to the movies. And the movies changed there every day or two because they were tourists and, you know, they want to have you keep coming back. And so that's Nantucket's where I got my movie education. That's where I saw Jaws for the first time, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and All the President's Men, The French Connection. I mean, all of these iconic films of the 70s and 80s, which is, the, that's how I grew up. Those are the films that I grew up on. And, um, and I'd started making films already. Some of my first films were on Nantucket, you know, with my, I picked up my dad's uh, Super 8 movie camera and when I was like eight and started bossing people around and suddenly I was a director. <laughs> so that's how you become a director. Everybody asked me how I did it, that's how I did it, so. Anyway, um, but years later, I now vacation with my family on Nantucket. And uh, uh, several years ago, I'd say about five years ago or so, uh, I was going on one of those walking ghost tours that they give, or you know, with this, you know, kind of animated host kind of walks you around the different haunted places of the island. And my then 10 or 11 year old daughter was with me and she was kind of into ghosts and that kind of thing. And so and my other daughter was as well. And um, so it just kind of, this Nancy Drew meets the Goonies thing just kind of dawned on me at that moment. I said, gee, why don't, this is where I, you know, this is, this would be a great story. So I, originally I was thinking it would be small, we'll just try to do it and show it on the island or something, but then it became something much more than that. And um, so I partnered with a screenwriter. I came up with the story and the concept and um, partnered with a screenwriter. We worked on it together for a while and didn't go anywhere with the script until it was really ready to shoot. I mean, which took many, many, many drafts, probably at least 10 drafts, and, and then more later on. Um, and then um, started to put the pieces together to make it as an independent film. You know, there's no one way to make an independent film. There right. are so many different ways, and you know, you come across one wall, you gotta go around it, find a different way, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, but it all starts with a great story and then a great script. And once we had that, uh, we got some actors attached. Bailey Madison, who's a young rising star, um, plays uh, Annabelle Hooper. She got attached about three years before we got the movie made. Um, uh, Robert Capron, another young actor who was in all the Diary from Whippy Kid movies and other things, uh, was attached as well. Once we had those two pieces, we then got some investors uh, to give some of the money, and then we had some of the money. And then we went out to Hollywood and got managed to get worldwide distribution before we even shot the movie. So once all that package was together, then the movie became a much more, you know, real sellable thing and, and, and that's how it came to be. Now you shot the whole thing on Nantucket. Mm -hmm. um, how hard or easy was this? And you know, it just, it, on the one hand it seems like it was perfect, but right. on the other hand, I and the other hand, the, the other hand is a pretty big <laughs> hand. There's, legit, um, there's logistics yeah, involved I mean, as well. Yeah. No, there were, yeah. and if I had a nickel for every person who told me, you know, it's set on Nantucket, but just shoot three days, second unit there, and shoot the rest in, you know, somewhere else doubling as Nantucket. And yeah. I, if I had a nickel for every person who said that, I wouldn't have needed investors. But <laughs> I just absolutely refused to do that. It was something that, you know, I wanted to make the movie authentic. The, the island is very much a character in the film. Yeah. Um, and I also knew that by filming there, the production value we would get from those locations would make the movie look like it was shot for three or four times what yeah. we made it for, and it did. <laughs> and so now the flip side of that is <laughs> then you're on an island and you have a crew and cast and staff of you know 70 plus people and that it's like moving a little army around the island every time you want to shoot. And I had, for two years prior to shooting, I had you know, made friends with the local town government there and the town manager and all of that, so they knew about the project. You know, it was a very, it's a wholesome family film, so it was presenting the island in a very good light. Yeah, so they sure liked did. that, and they were gonna be, the only thing they didn't want me to do was, you know, shoot in July and August, which 
if you know anything about Nantucket, you know the island practically sinks from so many people being here <laughs> in those months. So, but it's set in the summer. We had to shoot, uh, you know, so either in the spring or, or you know, early in the fall, and we shot in uh, September of 2015. Boom, mm -hmm. we shot. So, oh, yeah, right. and we shot it in. 14 days uh, for a feature film that's Ooh, wow. like kind of a world record. That's aggressive. Yeah. It's, it's, it it's really a love letter to Nantucket when yeah. you see it. Yes, you see it? Yes. it is. Yeah. And it's just gorgeous yes. to look at. Yes. And it's no yeah. easy task getting into the lighthouses or the whaling yeah. museum. And oh. yeah. We let people in there doing stuff. They like really that. don't. And Mark knows those locations yeah. too. And, and But we, you know, we were very respectful and, you know, we... They were so, you know, they gave us, they, they blocked streets when they needed to, you know, all of that, you know, and, and, but we were always very, you know, uh, protective of the island. I certainly was to make sure that it was being shown in the best light. And, uh, you know, we wanted people to love it, to be behind it and, and you know, cherish it. And it's, we, uh, the world premiere of the film was at the Nantucket Film Festival and um, uh, about a year, a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and. Uh, that is the phrase that they used. They, they felt it was a love letter to the island. So, yeah. which kind of, I guess it's my love letter to the island. But thank you yeah. for, for so many decades of, of, you know, helping me find the career I wanted to do. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, uh, as you start um, thinking about moving on to this next mm -hmm. film of his uh, with the Christmas story, um, one of the things you've already started is a sort of pre-trailer or mm -hmm. mini-trailer. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit, give us a little introduction to that. Sure, I guess we're going to take a look at it. Um, you know, as whenever you're pitching a movie project, you always want to have as many different, you know, visuals as you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, typically you would make, you know, if you're pitching something in Hollywood, you would, you know, have images of who your actors are or some pictures of some of your locations or, or that type of thing. And, um, but I always thought that, you know, uh, it, it was always a good idea to make something uh, that, that can show what your movie is in 90 seconds or, or less, something like that. And, um, and, so, and, you know, being a filmmaker, you want to go out and do stuff. So um, we did the same thing for Annabelle, where we made kind of a concept trailer. So this isn't the actress, to be clear. This is not the actual trailer for the film because we haven't shot the movie yet. Mm -hmm. But um, this will give you kind of a visual idea of what the, the basic, very broad stroke of what the story is about and some glimpses of some of the locations. We did shoot in Beacon Hill. Nice. Uh, it was actually a while back <laughs> that we shot these, and most of the footage in here, but. Um, it's like an elevator pitch, really. It is, mm -hmm. kind right. of. Yeah. Right. So it yeah. kind of gets you, exactly. you know, and, and so when you're in a pitch meeting or something and somebody's interested in your movie or network or something, well, here it is in 90 mm -hmm. seconds, rather than hearing me yap about it. Here, take a look okay. at this. Okay. Well, let's take a look. So what are you doing for Christmas? Hiding under my covers. Everyone's got a story. What's yours? Who are you, Jack Shepard? More than just a shop owner, I suspect. We have some, nice. some of the uh, pieces here on set, as you can see. Yeah, no these are uh, four of the ten original uh, mystery ornaments that we did. And this is the number one ornament right here. Yeah. And as I was telling you. Uh, I have it right here on the book cover. There of it is. Yeah. 
And as I was telling Carol earlier, the tenth ornament is so fragile, mm. and it's actually a bell. You know, every time you a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Mm. It was the kind of the last clue for the mm. for the whole mystery. So I couldn't bring it because I was afraid I was going to break it. And I've only got one. Understood. Mm -hmm. But this one here is the ninth ornament, and uh, when I first promoted this, there was going to be ten ornaments, but one of the ornaments uh, would have no clue whatsoever. Mm. And so this really becomes the red herring. We call it the red herring. Mm. There's no clue on it, but I wanted to make it one of the most beautiful ones, and so I put the silver dollar on there uh, and so forth. And I have the quote by Lincoln and all, all sorts mm -hmm. of things. Sure. Well, listen, we have so much more to get to. Yep. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in just a couple months after this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every year, 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. 40%. That's almost half the food we produce. Food waste is a serious problem. It impacts all of us. And it's expensive. Your family is throwing $1,500 a year in the trash. We're working hard to put food waste on the chopping block. And you can do the same at home. Learn how to cook it, store it, and share it. Just don't waste it. Go to savethefood.com. Welcome back to Novel Ideas. We're here with author Mark Duffield and Paul Serafini, our uh, producer director, and um, we're going to be talking the second half of the show about uh, Mark's book, The Lost Shepherd, Tales of the Tenth Ornament. The Last Shepherd, actually. I'm sorry. The That's Last okay. Shepherd. He's, he's a little not lost, lost too. Yet. <laughs> I, uh, I am lost, I'll admit it. <laughs> and I love the subtitle, A Wee Yarn of Wonder at Christmas Time. Mm -hmm. And so, would you tell us a little bit uh, about the book, where it originated from? And so well, the book originated from an idea from uh, Richard Thomas, uh, John Boy of the Waltons, who wandered into our store. And I was explaining that I was, and I hadn't even started yet, about these mystery ornaments I wanted to uh, have done, and then hopefully the whole country would come and get them. And he said, you know what you ought to do? And he actually bought the first ornament, which is right here. And, uh, but he said to me, he said, Mark, you know what you ought to do? And I said, anything you ask me to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, you ought to write a story and issue it one chapter a year. So as the ornaments go out, they're reading one chapter of the story. And the following year, they'd wait for the next two mystery ornaments and another chapter of your book. So have a little cliffhanger at the each one. And it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I mean, I know a good idea when I, when I hear one. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started to, to write it. And, but then it was time, well, what do I write, you know, basically? So uh, the title here, The Last Shepherd and Tales of the, of the Tenth Ornament, uh, was uh, there was all of us a need in our life that one person who comes to us, you can do it. You know, if you write anything, Mark, I'll edit it, I'll do this, I'll do that. And so I needed that one person, and she was just a customer uh, that came in very young and everything. And so uh, I said, if I ever write anything, I'm going to put your name in the title. And uh, her, last, her name was Kristen Shepherd, and it was spelled this way. That's the only reason Shepherd is in the title, because like all of us, if you make a promise, you keep a promise. You don't say things willy-nilly. You just do it. And then the tales of the tenth ornament, of course, were based on, on the ten ornaments. The last part of it, and I'd already kind of had that in my mind, was what if, what if uh, we, any of us, were the last person on earth and what we stood for. And that was kind of a very broad concept. But then I started thinking, all right, there's 10 ornaments. I'll have 10 characters. And I'll have those 10 characters, uh, in a way, demonstrate 10 qualities we can all agree on. Mm -hmm. So it became 10, mm -hmm. 10, 10. And that was the framework of starting a story. Mm -hmm. And so again, like uh, I might have been saying earlier, uh, the ten things we all agree on, goodness, kindness, generosity, empathy, sympathy, tolerance, love, all those kinds of things we all agree on. So that became the underbelly of the entire story. And then, uh, because of the, it was the last shepherd, I came up with two characters who were both orphans. So they are going to be the last of their lines. There's nobody to follow them. Nobody before them, nobody to follow them. They're all alone. But they represent all of these great qualities that all of us aspire to. So what if we lost them and that whole concept? So it had a, a little bit broader concept. And I think I might have told you at one time or another about the, the passenger pigeon. Uh, 
You know, I do a radio show with right. Radio Ray Brown, Talking Birds, Absolutely. everybody. And <laughs> little plug for Ray. Ray, Ray, the best. Ray. He's the, the greatest. That was subtle. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the story of the passenger pigeon was uh, for centuries, there were billions. They would blot out the sun flying over your house. Billions. But in 30 years, all those billions were reduced to one. Martha, the last passenger pigeon in the Cincinnati Zoo. So in a way, that's what the two last shepherds represent. What mm -hmm. if they weren't here? Right. And it really, in a way, saying, what if none of us were here? We're all the last of our own kind, in one sh uh, shape or another. And so that really became uh, the thing. But I needed somebody to tell the story. And I needed someone like Josh to be a reporter. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so it's interesting to me that you used a reporter in this sense. Yes. Uh, we all, you. as reporters, get assignments that maybe we're not crazy about. We mm -hmm. don't think maybe are worthy of what we do, and that's yeah. obnoxious, but it's the case. And so, in this case, he wasn't thrilled with the assignment he was getting, but he ended up, it, it blossomed. Yeah. That, I imagine that was part of sort of entering, and then all of a sudden it opens wide. I mean, that's probably- Well, he was, he was young, and it right. was his first assignment sure. uh, in our story. And so, and I didn't name the reporter uh, initially uh, because I was thinking of, you know, Thornton Wilder's Our Town, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's just the narrator, and it, but he did kind of what I did here. He's vignettes of people and everything mm -hmm. like that. And so he was just going to be the reporter, but then as I started writing it, I never named him, but he has to then come into the story uh, and to explain all the mysteries that happened. And he's presented with all these mysteries that disappear at the end. That's the magic at the end. And, uh, but in the meantime, he has told the story, and all of a sudden, he's dragged himself into the story. Right. And so then he has to come back and report to all of us. But he does this as an old man. That, to me, that was essential. He had to be very old. He's at the end. He has seen extraordinary things that he, if he had said, uh, if he had reported it, it's like you, Josh. I mean, if you went out and saw a flying saucer and little gray men, you're not going to go on the air with that. <laughs> and it's take a little bit of vetting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And our reporter in our story is exactly the same thing. He's seen something. He's a man of reason and fact. Right. And uh, the thing I always said, if, uh, if seeing is believing, uh, what happens when you see something that's unbelievable, inexplicable, and unexplainable? Who's going to believe you? Especially if your job is on the line. Mm -hmm. Better to gloss it over. And that's why now, near the end of his life, sitting in front of a roaring fire, it's his mea culpa, his confession. Mm -hmm. I've got to tell you what I saw. I don't care anymore what you think of me. And he goes and tells this extraordinary tale uh, of these characters. Mm -hmm. I want to jump in for a moment mm -hmm. here with Paul. So the characters are rich. Mm -hmm. They are realistic in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. some of them are based on reality. Mm -hmm. How is that something that appealed to you as someone who's going to be directing this film? What, what about the characters really spoke to you? Well, um, I, I think that the, the, the main thing you need for characters in a movie is relatability. Mm -hmm. You have to have somebody you can root for, somebody you're interested in because otherwise you're going to tune out after the first five to ten minutes of the film and not really care what happens to them. Um, you know, the great thing about this story is there's many hooks in it. And it jumps time spaces sometimes, you know, from one time period to another. And, um, you know, and uh, characters kind of come in and out. It's almost like two stories kind of being told at once in some ways with the reporter kind of looking back on, you know, the events that have happened. Um, and in the adaptation, you know, the film adaptation, um, it, there are some different things we're, we're going to explore because, you know, to make a feature out of a book, which is a relatively short book, you have to expand certain things sure. and, um, and also, you know, uh, curb them in certain ways to try to make sure that they develop and, and you're, the, you carry the audience along for that two hours which is, you know, if you think about it, is, is a bit of a, a time to set. And so you have to kind of, you know, keep that along. But I just, I, I, the characters are very relatable. They're people that you would, you know, see on the street or people in your neighborhood or people you can certainly relate to, uh, people that have ambitions, people that have dreams that some of which didn't work out or might not work out. Um, Jack is facing you know, the loss of, of, of the, the things that he cares the most about in life, his love, Gia, um, and um, uh, his store, um, who's, you know, the, the local um, uh, developer is, you know, bad guy, essentially. 
-hmm. I wanted to take the store away from him, essentially, to build, you know, something else. And, um, and I, I think that a lot of audiences can really relate to those types of things. And those are the, the underdog stories are really the ones that resonate, you know. Um, the, and you can name so many films that were, you know, the underdog is, those films are still watched, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. And um, so I think it's, a, and Mark's story has those. And so it makes it, you know, when you're doing the adaptation, it, you have a lot of material to work with, so. Do you envision this being a big challenge, uh, shooting on Beacon Hill? Enormous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that will be no smile. No. Nantucket, uh, yeah. Nantucket will be a cakewalk uh, comparing uh, to shooting yeah. on Beacon Hill for a variety <laughs> of reasons. But, I, you know, I, that's a bridge we'll cross when we come, when we come to it. But the, the, the thing is, in many ways, like Annabelle Hooper, where you know I went and, and got to know the town uh, government there and the people there, so that when it came time, if we got the movie put together and, and financed and made, um, that you know they would be accommodating to us. And Mark has already done that because everybody in that neighborhood is familiar with the book, which came out you know a few years ago, and um, and. Mostly, they're familiar with Mark. I mean, he's like a rock star. I've, I've walked down, you can't walk down Charles Street without stopping, getting stopped at least like seven or eight times by everybody and their mother to talk to Mark. And I think that that's just, you know, a testament of, of, of Mark's character and, and the relationships he's built up in that community. So if, you know, the planets line up and we're able to, to get the movie made, um, you know, we certainly. Like Annabelle, we wrote the script around existing locations, which is another mm -hmm. reason I absolutely wanted to shoot there. Last Shepherd reminds me of that in many ways because uh, th these are uh, many of these uh, points in here are existing locations, so it would be nice to, you know, to film in them. You know, realities will certainly come into play, you know, with interior shots and things like that, which will likely have to be, you know, done uh, done elsewhere. Still in Massachusetts, though, I absolutely want to shoot the whole movie here. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, certainly the exteriors uh, on Charles Street and, and all of the wonderful locations mm -hmm. of the book will try to do as much as, as much as they're willing to do. That nobody's going to shut down Charles Street for I mean, us. The great thing about <laughs> the exteriors, you could be shooting it today or 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's all there. Right. The only thing no that's question. different is the cars. Yeah. But everything else is pretty much the same. Yeah. And for uh, interiors and things like that, we have many friends there who have libraries where the Barneswell character could be in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we could find a lot of interiors uh, right there. Yeah. Everything is right there. Yeah. Mark, you know, Acorn you're, Street and so forth. Yeah. You're from a long line of storytellers. Um, do you think that that made this book easy? Yes. Or, I, mean, um, I, think, uh, uh, I mean, years ago, social media was sitting on a porch, on a porch swing, leaning over a fence while somebody's mowing a lawn. And that's how you exchange information. That's how you passed oral history down from your family and your heritage and so forth. And uh, that is very, very rich. It was personal, it's up close, face to face, and it became memorable. And that's why it sticks mm -hmm. in our mind. And so a lot of the stories you heard about your own heritage mm -hmm. and so forth are absolutely original. There's not a cliche in it. Mm -hmm. And I, want, I think I've shown this earlier, I'm gonna have you do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it to Josh. This is what I learned from you. Give me your hand, and I want you to squeeze that. Okay. Okay. Now give me this hand. And don't squeeze too hard, but squeeze. There's a difference, isn't oh, there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so my father said, Mark, this is cliche. Don't ever do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is cutting edge. Always do this. If you throw this rock into a pond, it's going to go plop and sink to the bottom. You take this one, and you skip it it'll live a lot longer. Never use cliche. And that's a hard thing to do because right. we're surrounded oh, yeah. by cliches. <laughs> uh, but you try at least for this, and that's what I tried to do in the book. Mm -hmm. And I think that's Beautiful. why it has so many different facets to it because mm -hmm. these are facets. Yeah. There's no facets here. And oh, that well. was the reason I uh, used these things. Yeah. Thank you for letting me use my dad's props. We have so much well, more we wish oh, we could get to. Yeah. People are going to have to buy this book and people are going to have to watch this movie, of course. This is The Last Shepherd and Tales of the Tenth Ornament. Mark Duffield, Paul Serafini, thank you so much for being here, Carol. Well, thank you yes. for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. It's yes. been great. Thanks, Absolutely. guys. You're just amazing. Oh, it's been you're so amazing. Fun. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Josh, as usual, my wonderful co host here. The show wouldn't be here without you and the folks at Access Framingham. Thanks to you. And 
to our viewers. We'll see you next time. Thanks.